Welcome back to the Christian Life Podcast, where we have good conversations for practical Christian living. Today, we're on episode number eight, and we're going to be talking about the resurrection and that key verse in Philippians 3, um, where it talks about the power of the resurrection. We are your hosts. My name is Michael Brazier, and sitting across from me is Art Nuremberg. So in preparation for our discussion, I think it'd be good to begin with a really broad I don't know, view of the resurrection, just like talking about the actual event of the resurrection. Okay. So when, how, obviously it's fundamental to the Christian life, but why is the resurrection so fundamental to the Christian life? Because we celebrate it every year at Easter. Like it is the biggest event of probably the Christian um, experience. So why is it so fundamental? Yeah. The resurrection is kind of almost the central truth. It is the crowning truth of the gospel message. Uh, We we think about the the wonderful feature that Christ died for our sins according to scriptures, but he was buried and he rose again on the third day according to scriptures. And without that resurrection, if if that's not a reality, the whole thing is just a made-up religion. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's, that's the way the early church, and that's the way Paul sees it. Paul in the book of Romans as he's talking about who Jesus is, he said that what Jesus' life testifies to is that according to the flesh, he was the Messiah of the Old Testament. Um, That was prophesied and it was fulfilled. And we know that he is who he is because of the fulfillment of that. But then he says this, and he was declared with power to be the son of God by the resurrection. That is God's great work of telling the world that Jesus is indeed the Son of God. Nobody else rose from the dead on their own. Nobody else came back. No teacher, no preacher, no no religious leader has ever done that. And so this is, it's the center, it begins as the center feature because it's in that is the proof that, uh, that, he is who he says he is. And ultimately, that's what people either accept or reject on this earth. If you, That's why we have to preach it. We're to preach Jesus and the resurrection. because, And that's what the early church did, because this was thrilling, that a man had beaten death. And that's a big deal, because death is a big enemy. So the defeating of death by a, by a teacher, at, he said he would do it, and he went and did it, uh, was to those men the proof that that it's real, and it was the thing that completely changed their experience, Hmm. and for which they they then, all 11 of the remaining disciples, plus Paul, all basically gave their lives. Now, John wasn't actually killed, but he was put through a lot of pain in his life for uh, the testimony to the gospel. But the rest of them all, as far as we know, all died martyrs' deaths, why did they do that? Because they had seen the resurrection, and that's, which is kind of the crowning uh, proof of it all, that men were willing to accept all of them, all 11 of them. Nobody turned around and said, you know what, it was a joke. We, we didn't know it was a, we were mistaken. They yeah. all held on to it right through to crucifixion and beheading and, and imprisonment and all the rest of it. It's the crowning, it's the crowning moment for Christianity. Yeah. So, and yeah, and that's what you were saying is one of the major proofs of the resurrection that it exists because why would 11 men die and give up their entire life for something that was fake, that they had all made up together, that they were like agreed to it. And then, and then they were like, they wouldn't flake out if it was all fake. Some of them would flake out. Right. A lot of them probably yeah. would. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you would say maybe a few, maybe yeah. a few would stick it out to the end. But but you're not going to die for something that you believe is is fake that you yeah. know is fake. Yeah. Um, when they received nothing for it. Yeah, it wasn't like they were building a big kingdom. They didn't have a big church. They weren't getting wealthy over this. Yeah. They weren't getting great prestige from anybody. A uh, handful of of believers that that followed them. Um, it just wasn't. There's no reason for them to stick with it, yeah. for, and except a, that they believed it. Yeah, and, and the uh, empire hated them. They were being persecuted for it, yeah. and the Jewish 
leadership hated them for right. it. Like it, <laughs> there was no yep. positive benefit yep. from a earthly perspective yep. for them to follow yep. the Lord. And, and it's one man said another one of the, the key, uh, just to know how strange this is. And I think you had mentioned this to me that, um, uh, earlier that, um, that the first testimony to the resurrection was from women. And in that world, that you would never yeah. have relied on the testimony of a woman for anything. Yeah. That's just a different culture. But they wouldn't have gone there. But they went there because that's the way it happened. Yeah. They didn't they didn't change the story to make it into a manly story for yeah. the sake of Roman consumption. It was just this is the way it happened. Mm -hmm. This is the way we saw it. Anyway, mm -hmm. yeah, that's it's really tremendous. Amazing. And the resurrection also, I think it's just important to know, it altered human history. It right. doesn't just alter our lives as Christians, but it right. altered culture. Right. Um, it's like, it's amazing to think of a massive empire, and the Roman Empire was so big. It was just incredibly massive. And it, within 300 years, was a Christian Amen. empire. And... Mm -hmm. You know, they went to an extreme of where they killed people if they weren't Christians. But 300 years prior, the emperor, like Nero, was killing all these Christians. Right. And then the emperor himself became a Christian or claimed to be. Yeah. So it it changed human history. Right. And, like, we are sitting here today talking about <laughs> this yeah. event. And, um, and that was their fundamental hope. Yeah. Their fundamental hope. I mean, why did people go to the because, to persecution? Why did they put up with it? Because there was a resurrection. You know, because they had a hope, the hope of that resurrection. They were counting on it. So it was, it, it's such a, a core part of Christianity. Um, it, anyway, we need yeah. to face that. And I think beforehand you were mentioning that, like, in the early church, it was so fundamental because they would begin, like on Easter Sunday, we right. always say, like, um, Christ is risen, and right. then everybody goes, he is risen indeed. But that became a, the, the opening line or the opening phrase that every congregation right. started their um, service with because it was so um, important. Was... Um, so it wasn't just an Easter thing. It was it's the reality of our new life um, in Christ. So let me see if I have any other questions related to, I think we covered like why it's a big deal, the proof of it. Um, so let's go to Philippians 3.10. So I, I want to talk about the phrase the power of the resurrection because okay. the resurrection impacted human history it impacts the church it's core but it also impacts us personally right. like right. drastically um so philippians 3 10 says that i may know him talking about jesus and the power of his resurrection and may share in his suffering becoming like him in his death that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. What is Paul, like, what is the context that Paul's talking about there in Philippians? Okay, for Paul, the um, the resurrection was key to the entire, the entire outworking of Christianity. Mm -hmm. right? In one act on the cross, Jesus dealt with every need we have, right? In that gospel... He, he dealt with the, the power of sin over us, but all, or the uh, guilt of sin upon us, but he also deals with the power of sin over us. And Paul saw that everything that, that God does in changing a man depends on not only the power of the Spirit of God who ministers this to us, but on that very life that comes out of or becomes ours because of our association with Christ on the cross. So he, when he's talking about the power of the resurrection, he's talking about everything that happens in my experience, whether it's for me personally or me interacting with someone else, which actually benefits them. It all comes because of a new life, and that new life is resurrection life. It's identification with Jesus Christ and his life in our life. And so Paul wanted to know that he wanted to know the Lord, but he wanted he wanted that to be so because that would that would enable him to be a benefit to somebody else, um, whether it's in sanctification or whether it is in 
teaching the word or anything else. It's the power of that resurrection that, that mm. would be, would, and it's a different kind of power. And it, it, it is sprinkled right through Paul's teaching. Yeah. I mean, there's without the power of the resurrection, you really are missing uh, what Paul's theology is. It's, it's anyway. Oh, that's really, really good. So one of the things I wanted to mention was, I guess I want to talk about is sometimes there's a, I don't know, shying away from the phrase, the power of the resurrection or that our lives are, we live in the resurrected power, but it's a biblical phrase, but some people, some Christians can shy away from it because of its attachment to other more charismatic leaning groups. And, but I think we have to come back to the reality that this is, it doesn't matter who grabs hold of it and attaches to it, but it, it goes back to the scriptures and that like, this is a fundamental core aspect of our, our new life. Right. Is that we live in the resurrected power. So we like, we should also grab onto it and hold onto it. It doesn't matter how someone else um, distorts it or changes it, but scripturally, biblically it is, it is central. So, with that being said, what um, you mentioned two ways, guilt on us, and what was the other way that you mentioned? Empowering to Empowering. overcome sin. Overcome yeah. sin. So let's talk about first the guilt on us. That How does it relate, how does the resurrection relate to God's justification of us as sinners? Okay, Romans chapter 5 says this, that he was crucified for our sins, we're talking about Jesus, and he was raised because of our justification. Hmm. In a real sense, belief in the resurrection is the foundation, and it's, it's that fact that enables me to know that my sins were actually taken away on the cross. Okay, Lots of men died on a cross. If one had been designated, if Jesus had just gone to the cross and said, I'm going to go to the cross, I'm going to pay for your sins, and he dies, how do I know if that's of any value whatsoever? I mean, he's just another dead man who said something. But when he rose from the dead, it's a testimony that something has happened there, that the sins that he took on him were paid for, and God is now pleased, and he he brings him back to life, that it has no, death has no hold on him, as we we say. In that, I can know through the resurrection that my sins are forgiven. That's a big thing, too, because justification is the basis of our Christian life. Without justification, we're never going to be able to experience the life God has for us. And it's only because it's when I see that Jesus was raised from the dead that I have the assurance, because that doesn't happen every day. People don't rise from the dead. We have to keep hammering the, we talk about it so often that I think we forget that this is really a big deal. It's a unique situation. Um, And so when he is raised from the dead, first of all, I know that um, the sacrifice was accepted Hmm. and that it's now finished and I can now trust that um, I am justified. I have a right standing with God because Hmm. of what the Lord did for me. So that's the first half of it. That's the first half. Now, can I assume most people would understand what justification is, but not necessarily. So can you explain what is justification? Like if you're okay. talking to someone who has never heard about Christianity, they're like, what are they talking about? Okay. Um, man's greatest problem with regards to God is that he, we have guilt before God. It's just we've done the wrong yeah. thing. Whether it's a big thing or a little thing, we've done the wrong thing. Everyone has the responsibility or the, it's just going to happen to everyone. We're all going to stand and give account before God. God will then be the judge. The, um, the judge will say something. In the Roman world, when you stood before a judge, he would say, instead of guilty or not guilty, which is the American way, uh, he would say either justified or condemned. The man is justified, and justified means he hasn't committed a crime. Hmm. He has not committed a crime. This is not true of him. Uh, of course, condemn means that, okay, he's worthy of punishment. He has broken the law, and he's, he's worthy of punishment. Justification 
is that process by which God pays for our sin in such a way that we can stand before God and have him who is holy and righteous actually declare, state that we are not guilty. We are to be justified is to be not guilty, declared not guilty. And that's not to be forgiven. It means that you're not, you didn't do anything. That's what the judge would be saying. He's not, he's not saying I'm forgiving you for this. He's saying you didn't do it. You did not commit this crime or a crime. And uh, so justification is that status that we have whereby when we get before God, um, before the, the judge of all the world, he says he's not guilty. He did that by himself paying the price and eliminating my sin and then giving to me the standing of his son before him. So yeah, that's really important. Yeah. It's important that like grasp that right. understanding of it. And it means that, again, as we said, it's, a, it's the foundation because um, it means that now I can know that the eternal God is towards me, not just because he likes me in some sentimental way, but he has actually taken my sin out of the way, which is the only thing that God hates. He hates mm-hmm. sin, he hates that with a, a passion, if you would, but yeah. it, it, however you want to put it, that's maybe not the best way, but he, he is opposed to that without reserve. That's what wrath's all about. But if you take that out of the way, there's no reason for him to be irritated with me. There's no reason for him to be against me. Mm-hmm. In fact, he now, because he is the he's the fount of all blessing, can be blessed towards me. Mm-hmm. I have to know that in the Christian life uh, to be able to live the Christian life, or else you you have these terrible problems of well, oh, I made a mistake, uh, guilt, 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 guilt. No, I've been raised, or he's raised, because we are justified. Tremendous truth. Yeah. The yeah. resurrection allows us to live a life that is free of guilt because right. Jesus Jesus took that and we are justified before God. So when right. he sees us, he sees Jesus right. and we are no longer condemned under God's wrath. Right. But the second part is also that it, our lives are changed because we have power to overcome sin. Right. And so let's talk about that. Um, I think of when I think of that, I go to that passage in First Corinthians where Paul says, "Like such were some of you, but now right. like, you're not." Right. And so, um, the resurrection brings radical life change because we have power to overcome sin. So, yeah, talk about that. Okay, um, Jesus came; we might have life. Okay, we've been thinking about that. We might have it abundantly. Um, in order for me to have real life and be free, I have to be free from sin. That's, it's also in John. He says that any man who commits a sin, slave of sin. And, and then he says that um, if the Son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. We have the guilt problem. That justification settles that. But at the same, in the same gospel story, there is if I'm not set free from my continuous sinning, then I can't really experience life. It's just it's not true because sin brings death. That, it's, that's all the way through the New Testament. Um, so in order that that might be so, God not only justifies us, but something has to, has to change in me. I, I committed sins against God because of something that was wrong with me in my core being. Um, at the cross, God identified me with Jesus Christ. When he was raised, I was raised. And it says there, I was raised to newness of life, right? And it's, um, that's why Paul in chapter uh, 6 of Romans says this, that you're to count yourself as dead to sin, right, to the power, and alive to God. Now I have life, but I have life because I'm identified with Jesus Christ, not just because I had a new start. It's not a new start of the old life, right? I've just <laughs> done the same yeah. thing, but I have a new power, all right? Now, I have to learn how to handle that power. I have to learn how to to live it out. Mm -hmm. And there's a sanctifying process in that. But the potential of me being set free from sin is all tied to not just what his forgiveness, but his new life in me. Mm -hmm. And this is, again, it's core to Paul's instructions on, on Christian living so that 
this thought. Um, if you go both to Colossians and the book of Ephesians and go through there over and over again, Colossians, he does it three times. He goes over the fact that you're dead with Christ and you're alive, you're alive to God because of he, he was raised from the dead. So not only was I, does that justify me, but it also gives me the life. So I'm now identified with the Lord in, in who he is and uh, in, his, in his resurrection life. And that's, that gives me a chance to be set free. Right, so I, that, and again, there's a lot to describing how that brings about it, mm. but, and that's again one of the things I think Paul was um, concerned about. That, okay, that I might know the power of his resurrection, okay, uh, so that I can live the Christian life. But then there's a third dimension of, or another dimension of it, which is, hey, how can I meet? somebody else's need how can it be that my life could affect someone else in a po- in a permanently positive way mm-hmm. not just in a temporary alleviation of pain but how can it do it um that resurrection life is is there it's, you know that um to to enable me and again and it's tied in in so many different ways in the abiding passage and in John chapter 15, in um, the put off and put on passages in Colossians and Ephesians, in the present yourself to God, your members as instruments of righteousness, because you're now in Christ in Romans chapter six, it just, it's all through there. Mm -hmm. So what would you say to a person who says like, why do we still struggle with sin? If Christ died and we live in that resurrection power, okay. why were why are we not just fully sanctified and we don't struggle with sin when we have okay. Christ in us? Like, yeah, okay. What would you say to a person who is struggling with that their sin, and yet they are a Christian and they have the resurrection power? Okay, the redemption is not complete. We're not finished. He isn't finished yet. Um, he's not going to finish on this earth. I still live in a, a body which is dying. Mm-hmm. And that body, I mean, that's still the evidence that there are traces of the curse still holding on to me. In the New Testament, that is basically described as flesh. It calls it flesh. It's a tendency in me that um, opposes God doesn't want to submit to God. Okay, that continues to be there. Paul is, is clear on that. And because that's still there, and because we live in a world where the devil still dominates it mm-hmm. and still wants to, he's still going to bring temptation. He's still going to move people to try to pressure me towards sin. I still have within me a tendency to buy that, which I have to deal with. Mm-hmm. Those are the reasons why sin still pops up and sin's still a problem to overcome so that Christianity doesn't eliminate all of my problems. It just gives me power to overcome them. There'll be a day when we get to heaven and the redemption's complete. In heaven, the flesh is gone. This is all, now we're in resurrection bodies. Now we're in a different situation. And, um, and that's like the big hope in the resurrection because in like first Corinthians 15, right. It's like that big passage on the resurrection. It ends with like that beautiful reality of you know, death. Where is your sting? Right. Like, Cause we have been transported into our resurrection bodies and, and all the things that were once hindering us and, and holding on to us like death and sin, right. they, they don't touch us anymore. Right. And that's like the ultimate, reality right. of living yeah. of, of the resurrection yeah and it's that's still out ahead yeah. and uh but right now we have a big privilege to testify to him and prove we love him yeah in heaven i don't, I don't know i don't know that much about what heaven's actually going to be <laughs> <laughs> i just uh, i read the pictures and i'm sometimes baffled by them but um i'll enjoy it when it gets there but yeah. in this experience here while we still have all that, I have a cho- I can make choices to love Jesus, and that's that's a big part of it. That because that's still there, I can choose. I can choose to love Him instead of loving myself. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's what Paul says concerning it. 
that those that belong to the Lord, those who have really come through, they've taken an attitude towards that flesh. They said they've crucified it. They, they, they've said goodbye to it. They, have, they themselves have pushed mm-hmm. it out. But he still says it's there because in that same passage, he, he also says in Galatians chapter 5, when he's talking about the fullness of the Spirit, he says this, if you walk in the Spirit, okay, if, if you let the Spirit guide you and, and sanctify you, if you walk in the Spirit, you won't carry out the lusts of the flesh. But you'll still have them. Mm-hmm. There will still be those drives. But they'll be subdued, and your life, you will choose the resurrection life. So it's, it is constantly a choice. So yeah. When Jesus is describing a Christian in the book of Revelation, in those first three chapters, he talks about those different churches. He can say this about it. He says, to those that overcome, to those that overcome. <laughs> you see, yeah. in this life, we're still overcomers. And, we have, and one of the things we have to overcome is our own tendency to sin. But we have life to do it with. We've been separated. It's, it's kind of complicated. We could go into yeah. a lot more, but be there. Yeah, that's really good. I think, I think we'll end there today. Okay. Um, because I think if we keep going, we'll run out of time. But do you have anything else that you want to conclude with? Like anything that you didn't head on? No, I think we'll leave it right there. Yeah, okay. that it's it is the core. It's yeah. the core. Knowing that I'm identified with Christ is the core of my ability to live out this life. And it's because of his life in my life. And that's what we call resurrection life. Amen. That's really good. Um, I hope that encouraged all of you. And you can, of course, follow us on all of our social media, um, on Facebook, Instagram, and X. And you can listen to all of these episodes on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube. And we will see you again next week. May the Lord bless you.